Now, the shocking thing is that we have no biblical basis of our celebrations. When the Bible is it written that Jesus was born on the earth? It's not written anywhere. We do not have the birth of Christ. That came from the Babylonian system. How could shepherds be outside in the night taking care of animals in winter? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word together. Thank you for the records, Jesus, that led us to you and eternal life in you. Jesus, let your Holy Spirit now implant upon our hearts your truths. Thank you, Jesus, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted, and unhindered by satanic or demonic forces. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. For those that have joined us online, thank you. Don't forget to scan the QR code on your screen so you can get more details. Also, click that... Uh, it, it's what? Uh, it's, it's a bell. Click that bell icon on your screen and uh, so we can always send you notifications as and when we release an episode. Don't forget to leave us a comment if you're blessed by these, by these studies. You ready, guys? All right. Today we are going to Genesis chapter 10. This is where we're going to expound and study more details. Genesis chapter 10 is, you know, mostly and commonly known as the Table of Nations. Uh, in chapter 10, we're going to see mostly the three sons of Noah. That is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're going to see how these three boys progenited our, you know, the, uh, most of the nations as we know them today. Uh, we, we, we will see in the first section, you know, that lists the sons of Noah and the descendants of Japheth. Japheth, uh, Japheth's people apparently settled mostly in the lands of the north and of the region that would become the promised, you know, land of Israel. The second section details mostly uh, Noah's son, Ham. Remember Ham? Yeah, Ham was, you know, was the father of Canaan. Canaan was the kid that was, you know, cursed. We studied that in the last episode. So the people and nations that come from Ham will become central mostly to Israel's story, uh, as told in the rest of the Bible, as we will be studying. Ham's descendants include the peoples, who will eventually become Egypt, uh, the great nation that we know, that will play, you know, a vital, you know, role in Israel's history. Egypt, we'll study mostly about Egypt when we get to Exodus, how Jacob, you know, went to Egypt and his sons and, and they were in, in, in slavery for almost 400 years. We'll study most details there about Egypt. Ham's grandson, a one, a uh, key person we're going to find also here is uh, Nimrod. Nimrod came through the lineage of Cush. Uh, we'll establish the, you know, a very powerful kingdom. That is the kingdoms of Babylon and uh, Syria. Who will both you know, become enemies of Israel at a later stage as we will study. And the descendants of Ham's sons, that is Canaan. You remember Canaan who was cast? If you missed out the last episode, please do so. That is episode number nine. It has more details about the curse. Why, you know, Canaan was cursed instead of, you know, his father Ham. Yet actually it was, you know, it was Ham that saw the nakedness of his father. Please find out more details on that episode. But otherwise, the descendants of Ham, you know, Ham's son, that is Canaan, will eventually be the most you know, mostly driven from the promised land of Israel. And in the final section of, of, of chapter 10, uh, we'll find the descriptions of the other son, who is the third son, that is Shem. It is through the line of Shem that we shall have Abraham. And uh, through Abraham, we'll come down to, you know, the nation of Israel. You together? 
Yeah, the dispersal of the people into the separate nations, separate languages, uh, the different tribes will also happen, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, and the surrounding of, uh, of the story of the Tower of Babel, uh, as it was mostly described in Genesis chapter 11. But we will start a bit details, you know, ahead. Though today we'll just look at some, 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 some basics and summaries and more of an introduction of the person called Nimrod, who Nimrod was and how he became to be the person he was. You know, what the motive was behind the building of the Tower of Babel. Uh, we will find that in a few, in a few minutes. All right, so let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Uh -huh. We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Take note. It is very clear that these sons were born after, I mean, the sons of these three boys were born after the flood, not before the flood. So the genealogies here that we are studying mostly were probably compiled by Shem. Uh, he only followed the descendants of his two brothers till about the time of the Tower of Babel. You know, the time when the nations were, when, when the kids were divided into different nations and to different languages. He sort of stopped tracking them at that point. And then he started focusing mostly on his line. Verse 2. The sons of Japheth. Uh -huh. So the sons of Japheth, we have Goma. Goma was the father of the Germanic people. And Magog. Magog, uh, these were fierce and warlike people and presided over Gog. Uh, from Magog came the Scythians and the Russians, you know, that we know today. Later in the, in the Apocalypse, that is around Revelations chapter 20, verse 8 to 10, Gog and Magog appeared, you know, they appear as two distinct nations combined against the Church of God. You can find a bit of those details about these two nations. Uh, that is in Revelations chapter 20, verse 8 to 10. And Madai. Madai is the father of Needs. And Javan, Javan, it's through the Javan that we get the Greeks, you know, the Greeks we know today. And Tubal. Uh, Tubal is the modern day Tobolsk. Uh -huh. Yeah, the modern day Tobolsk. And Meshek. Uh, Meshek would be the modern day Moscow. And Tyrus. Tyrus became the Thracians. Uh, yeah, they became the Thracians. Now, the names of Japheth's seven sons would be associated with you know, city-states that are mentioned at a later time in the scriptures, uh, such as we have Magog, who is later on referenced to or mentioned in Ezekiel 38.2. Uh -huh. We also have Tashish. He was later also, you know, uh, noted in Genesis 10.4. And we also find him in Psalms 72.10 and Ezekiel 38. 13. And then Kitim. We will find Kitim in Genesis 10 4, Numbers 24 24, and Daniel 11 11 what? 11 30. Yeah. So you, you could find more details there about these kids. And the sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, Rifath, and to, you know, Togama. These would be the Germanic people, you know, the Germans as we know them today. And the sons of Javan, we have Elisha, and Tashish, Kirim, and Dodanim. 
Dodanim, that is the area of Europe, uh, Scandinavia, England, all these became the descendants of Japheth. So by these were the isoles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tank, after their families in their nations. So basically, the sons of Japheth were the progenitors of what we know or what is known as the Indo-European nations. If you, are, if you have an European background, it's very likely that you, you know, you're a descendant of Japheth. Now, the interesting thing about Japheth, we find it in the prophecy of Noah, and that is Genesis chapter 9, verse 27. If you would quickly just go there. If you missed the last episode, please do so. It has this prophecy and a bit of details. But yes, it reads, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of shame. What an interesting prophecy. And amazingly, it actually came to pass. When Shem's descendants rejected the Messiah, you know, Jesus Christ, then basically it was the European nations that picked up Christianity. And because of that, we do dwell in the covering that God gave, Shem. Remember, it is through Shem that we shall have Abraham. From Abraham, we'll move to David. And then from David, we'll move to Jesus. So meaning Shem, it is through shame that Jesus Christ, or the Messiah, comes. And because shame, all the descendants of shame rejected the Messiah, the Europeans, the sons of Japheth, did, did pick up Christianity. They embraced it with two hands. And it was them that actually transported this Christianity across the world. Here in Africa, Christianity was mostly brought about by, by the missionaries, isn't it? And most of these missionaries came out of Europe. So, we have come to dwell and find our place in the covering of Jesus Christ. And we are so glad, and, and we are so glad and blessed and thankful for the descendants of, you know, Japheth, having brought Christianity in Africa as we know today. So it's basically the people of Japheth who have embraced Christianity or the gospel and it was them that carried it across the world. This is the fulfillment or it became the fulfillment of prophecy of Noah. So at this point, uh, Japheth's descendants are dropped when the Gentiles are divided in their land. You remember when God said, let us go down and confuse these people with multiple languages. Uh huh. At, at that point is when the, you know, the separations happened. This took place at the time of the building of the Tower uh, of Babel. Shem sort of lost track of his brothers uh, and the descendants of his brothers once that scatter happened. And, and, and from that point, when, when the scatter happened, we sort of went to a pause into tracking the descendants of those other two boys until at a little time when we pick up with the Canaanites. But then from that point, we sort of started picking up with Abraham and the descendants of Abraham, as we're going to be studying. All right, verse 6. And the sons of Ham, uh, we, we have Cush, we have Mizraim. It's Mizraim that, you know, became Egypt. We have Phut and Canaan. These went literally south and populated mostly Africa. And the sons of Cush, we have Saber, we have Havila and Sabter, and Rama and Sabter, and the sons of Rama. Uh, we have Sheba and Dedan, and Cush begat Nimrod, an interesting character, a very interesting king. So who was Nimrod? Uh, let me give you a bit of details about this guy. You know, this king, uh, quite a dynamic king. Nimrod comes from the Hebrew verb Marad, uh, which, you know, means rebel and appears about four times in the, you know, in the Hebrew Bible. And, and those four times we find them in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, 
in 10 and, and, and verse 9, 8 and 9. And then we also find him in First Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 10. And then we also find him in Micah, uh, that is chapter 5 and uh, verse 6. So Nimrod is described as, you know, as one of the first mighty men to appear on earth after the great flood. Previous to the flood, we had, you know, we read about the Nephilims, uh, you know, those giants, the mighty men on earth. But the Bible says they were before the flood and after the flood. We do find that in Genesis 6-4. So after the flood, one of the next mighty man becomes Nimrod. So from the examination of the scriptures, you know, the biblical texts, and you know the ancient documents, we sort of came to a clear understanding that Nimrod was one of those, you know, uh, one of these mighty men. And there's evidence to prove that he was larger in terms of the body size. He was larger than the average, you know, the average man. He was sort of a giant. And so to speak, the Bible calls Nimrod a mighty man or a mighty hunter before the Lord. So Nimrod uh, established a great kingdom uh, that included the Babel. It included the Irach, the Akkad, and the Kalner. Uh -huh. And the Kalner in the land of Shina. We do find a bit of those details in Genesis chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. He later on extended his kingdom into Assyria where he built the cities of, uh, of Nineveh, uh, Rehoboth, Kelar, and Rizem. We can find those in verses 11 and 12. You know, uh, just ahead we'll see that as we move on. Nimrod was obviously a skilled man. And he was also an ambitious man. Skilled and an ambitious leader. Besides being the father of the infamous you know, Babel and many other cities, Nimrod was a mighty man with great physical strength and a great strength of will. He, if he was also a giant you know, in structure, then that would be another reason you know, why the people of his time would you know, sort of follow him, you know, especially if he was... It explains why people followed him, uh, mostly because of his size, and why so many legends would spring up, you know, around him as we read history. There are very many other instances, you know, in the Bible, of giants. You know, uh, they appear mostly connected to the line of Ham, and mostly through the line of Nimrod. When we, when you remember when Moses sent the spies into the land of Canaan, yep, we find that I think in Numbers thirteen thirty-three. Yeah, you know the spies came back with a report, and when they were telling Moses, they said we felt that we were like grasshoppers in the size of these giants. They were so small; they were like grasshoppers. They compare themselves to the size of grasshoppers. Now, these giants we speak about were mostly through the line of, you know, of Nimrod, uh, the grandson of Ham. <clears throat> the Canaanites uh, were descended from Canaan. You remember the Canaan, the last born of Ham, who was cast by his grandfather, Noah. And thus, they are related to Nimrod. We're together? Yeah. The other passages refer to Raphael, and of course David had uh, had a face. If you remember, he had to face one of those big giants called Goliath, and 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 and, 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 and uh, you know had four brothers. We find that I think in Second Samuel 21, 15, 15 to twenty-two. So Nimrod, as the leader of the kingdom of Babel, which he built. Nimrod also is connected to the Tower of Babel. 
we'll find that in Genesis chapter 6, I think. According, uh, in according to the historian, Josephus. Josephus, you know, says that Nimrod, you know, Nimrod, he said he would revenge uh, on God. All right? He would be revenged on God. If he should have a mind or, you know, to, you know, to drown the world again. You remember in the last episodes we've been studying about the great flood, how God rain, you know, how rain flooded the earth and it destroyed almost all living creature. Yeah, so Nimrod said, if, if God, if God should have a mind again to flood the entire world, the entire planet as we did, as he did prior to now, he decided that he's going to build a tower. That however much God flooded the earth, that water would not flood the tower. It would be so high that regardless, he would be able to survive the flood. So, he said, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. It was sort of a revenge. Should God do this, he's going to do this. He's going to create a way in which he sort of survives the second flood ish, should it ever happen again. We can find a bit of those details in Josephus' uh, uh, descriptions, mostly, in the Antiquities of uh, the Jews, that is book one and chapter four. So the motive, according to Josephus, for building the Tower of Babel was to protect humanity against another flood, should it ever happen again. But remember, God had said, he had promised that he's not going to flood the earth again. He said he will never destroy man again with a flood. And by doing so, he actually gave us a symbol of the rainbow. So Nimrod, in doing this, he was actually doing a rebellious act. He was against the word of God. He was acting against the will of God. He was a rebellious leader before the Lord. In fact, the word that says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, that was in the negative sense, not in the positive sense. In other words, he was hunting against God's will. He was a rebellious leader. So Nimrod was rebellious against God, just like his antediluvian forebears. And according to Joseph, he persuaded his subjects. You know those that build the that build the, uh, the, the 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 Tower of Babel. He persuaded them not to ascribe. You know, their strength to God. He sort of misled people away, or he led people away from the will of God, or from the belief of God to his own. And uh, as if it were through his means, they were happy. He sort of, he was like, hey, I'm the right path to happiness. Forget about God. God destroyed the entire planet with the flood. Follow me. If you could follow me, I'm going to give you life everlasting. Should God ever flood the earth again, I'll be able to save you. He won't be able to destroy you as he did. Destroy our forebears or our fathers. And, and so that's how he managed to convince most of these guys to follow him. And, and, and as we're going to study, he came up with what we call the Babylonian religious system. We'll study that uh, in a bit. So, construction of the Tower of Babel ended with a show, of course, of God's power as, we, as we, we, we're going to study that. You know, the Bible says the Lord came down and he confused people with multiple languages. By doing that, he made it impossible for them to communicate effectively enough so as to finish the construction of the, you know, of the tower. The engineers spoke a different language from the foremen. The foremen spoke a different language from the other servants and, 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 and all these helpers. So in that, they were not able to communicate correctly. Being not able to communicate correctly, the project sort of just 
halted and uh, it became desolate later on. So as we study, definitely Nimrod was proven wrong, isn't it? I mean, God proved him wrong. And so what do we learn from this? Uh, one thing we learn for sure is that money's strength comes from God. Money's strength and the ability. These are gifts we get from God. And, and because it is a gift, God can choose to revoke it just about any time. You cannot take pride, you know, into that as, as, as we can see, as we can see how Nimrod did. So Nimrod, uh, you know, at a later stage, we came up with a vocabulary today, which we call Nimrod, which with a small N, which literally means the hunting expert of devotee or the hunting expert of devotee. And for the brief time in the 1980s, Nimrod was more or less than, um, than a heroic slang term for the jig or socially awkward person. You know, if in a society you perceive to be awkward, they would just call, hey, Nimrod, to represent, you know, that kind of a person. Uh, later on, Nimrod appears in characters in the mythology of many Asian cultures. He shows up in, um, in the Hungarian systems, in the Greek mythologies, in the Arabic, he comes up again in the Syrians, and mostly in Armenian legends. He, he sort of, I haven't seen Nimrod in our African culture. Do we have it? I don't think so. Do we? Yeah, I don't think so. <clears throat> So Nimrod was undoubtedly a powerful, charismatic person. He was a hero-like figure, you know, in the day of the ancient world, who actually attempted to build a tower that would reach heaven, hoping to thwart God's plans. He thought that God had a plan of, you know, destroying the earth again with water. So in doing this, he, he was coming up with an antidote to God's intentions if he ever came up with such plans again. It isn't so hard to see why so many myths and legends will spring about, you know, about this man called Nimrod. In the end, anyway, uh, Nimrod's power and glory came to nothing. God came down. He confused them with languages. They all sort of dispersed. And history was picked up again with the line of shame. We will not read so much after that about this person or character called Nimrod. However, the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. But humility before the Lord is the posture for the wise. It's really key that you have humility. Pride can take you any farther. In fact, Proverbs 3, we can find a bit of Proverbs 3, 34, uh, about that, uh, 34 and 11 too. You can also find some deals there about that in James 4, James 4, 6, and 1 Peter 5, 5. The spirit of Babylon. Babylon was the very first you know, the Babylonian religious system was founded by this figure we just studied about called Nimrod. Yeah. So Nimrod's uh, rebellious or rebellion against God is you, you know, God's will or use of the patriarchal government is at the very root of what the Bible refers to as the spirit of Babylon. Are uh, we together there? You've heard of that terminology, I'm sure, before today. But it comes down at the point when Nimrod rebelled against the patriarchal government. The spirit of Babylon. Nimrod's rebellion uh, you know, against God's use of the patriarchal government you know, is at the very root of what the Bible refers to as the spirit of, of, you know, of, of Babylon. What 
does it really mean? The spirit of Babylon is, you know, resident with every human that wishes to do things or to seek to operate on their own. They do not see the need for God's blessings or God's oversight. They feel they can achieve things on their own. They don't need God. Anybody who operates in that kind of a state, who feels they don't need God to achieve uh, his blessings, is one we would say is operating under the spirit of Babylon. Why? Because surely man cannot rule himself, especially outside out of outside of God's authority. You can't. You you need God. You need God. You cannot rule yourself without the help of God. Are we together? Yeah. So when we look at Nimrod closely. We have a few, a few characteristics that relate him with Lucifer. Nimrod, first of all, his actions nearly mirror those of Lucifer. Lucifer was the fallen angel. If you remember this guy, uh, the Bible says that, and God, you know, for, there was, in him there was pride, you know, that was discovered in him. And, 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 you know, and because of that, he, he later on got kicked out of heaven. We did find more details in, uh, I think it's an episode two. Yeah, episode one. It's actually episode one. If you've not watched episode one, please do so. It has a bit of more of, of, of those details about what exactly happened to Lucifer. So, Nimrod, he, firstly, he's born into a patriarchal system. Which later on, he does what? He disdained. Or he, he sort of, you know, he rebelled against it. Lucifer, on the other hand, he was also created as an angel. You know? And, 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 and when he was created, he was created under the monarchical or the, monarch, the, the monarchical system. A system that is laid by one person and that was God. But later on, the Bible says he could not tolerate that system. He wanted to build his tower, so he's thrown above that of God. So you see the difference. You see the car the similarity between these two people. Nimrod was born at the time when the system was laid by the elders. It was the elders that were the leaders. Now he comes up and he says, "No, no, 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 no. I want a system where I am the leader. I don't necessarily need to listen to the elders." My word is my, you know, my word is my, my say and my will. Lucifer, same thing. He comes up in a system where God is the head. He's a subject. But then he wants to build his throne above. Yes. Yeah, above the stars. So Nimrod's rebellion against God, uh, against God is patriarchal institution led men, of course. Uh, women and children away from the leaders. Remember, all these guys used to listen to their fathers and their ancestors. But now he led them away from them. And he led them to himself. Okay? We see Lucifer when he fell. The Bible says he fell down with a third of the angels. He rebelled against God. And he fell down with those angels. So you can see that there's a bit of a, there's much similarity between these two characters. I have no doubt that as the Bible says, in the days before the flood in Genesis 6 and after the flood, were these mighty men, uh, these Nephilims. I have no doubt that Nimrod was one of those Nephilims who later on was manifested through him. All right, let's continue. So he began to bar, uh, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Jesus. The mighty hunter before the Lord is not in a good sense, as I shared. It is, a re it is in a rebellious sense against the Lord. He rebelled against God. Nimrod is the founder. Remember, he's the founder of the Babylonian religious system. And he became a dictator of the civilization that he established at the time. So wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter 
before the Lord. Verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shina. In the future, Nimrod's descendants will become some of Israel's greatest enemies. Uh, you know, the Canaanites, including the Canaanites, but mostly the, you know, Anak, the tribe of the Anaks. We'll start about that. Out of the land went forth Ashur and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kala and Rizen. Rizen mentioned in this verse is the final of Nimrod cities to be builded or to be mentioned. The name Rizen likely meant you know, fountainhead. And the city may have been situated in the, on the Tigris River. Yeah. So between Nineveh and Kala, and the same is a great city. Let me give you some details about the about Nimrod and especially this religious system that he founded. You know, the Babylonian religious system that infiltrated our, you know, our churches as we know some today. Nimrod had a wife. Uh, her name was Sinaramis. And she became known as the Queen of Heaven. Okay? Be attentive. Uh, the Queen of Heaven, oh, Sinaramis, had a son. She claims, she claims that she produced this son without having a sexual relationship with a man. In fact, she claims that this boy was a virgin birth, or like what we read about Jesus. Uh, the name of this boy was called Tammuz. He was called Tammuz, a virgin birth, or a virgin born. So this boy was to be groomed and to be centered for worship by his father. In others, as Nimrod, the king Nimrod, and the queen of heaven, Sinaramis, they produced this young boy, and they sent this boy to be the center of worship. In other words, the Babylonian religious system was centered around worshiping this young man called Tammuz. Together, one day, while Tammuz was hunting, a wild boar attacked him. It, it go at him. And apparently, he died. He died for he died for three days and three nights. Yep, that's what the history says. And they started looking for him. His father sent out, you know, his security detail as they were looking for him in the fields where he had gone hunting. They found him, and on the third day, which is the day they found him, he revived. He became alive again. In other words, he resurrected on the third day. All right? Does that sound familiar? Yes. Uh -huh. Tammuz. Tammuz's birthday was celebrated on the 25th of December every year. Yep. His birthday. He was born on the 25th December. Sounds familiar? Aha. Uh -huh. And his birthday was celebrated by giving of gifts. You know, we with drunken orgies and the cutting of what we call the Yule 
trees. Yield trees is what we call here in Africa Christmas trees. Do you remember a Christmas tree? Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they would cut this Christmas tree and they would decorate it with silver and gold and, and they would place it in homes. They would put beautiful decorations. Now, back then they didn't have the Christmas lights. So they had these other different decorations. Today, we also add Christmas lights onto those trees. So they would later on burn that, you, you know, that, that, that Christmas tree or the Yule log and you know, on the fire until it was completely consumed. Why they did that, it was apparently for luck and fortune. So when you burn it and it's totally consumed, you'd sort of get luck and fortune. Though I don't remember practicing that in Africa, do we? Did we used to burn them? Nah. Huh? Yeah. Did we used to burn those trees? Nah. It was mostly done by those guys. For us, we had them, we decorated them, but we used not to burn them, I think. Now, why did they choose the Christmas tree? Or the Yule tree? Yule is Y-U-L-E. Just in case you're wondering the spelling. It was evergreen tree. You know, that tree never dries. From January to January, regardless of the season, it is always green. Here in Africa, we mostly use it as a, you know, as a perimeter wall for homes, you know, sort of create a subdivision between you and your neighbor. So it was ever green. And they chose it as a symbol for perpetuated life. In other words, you're going to have a perpetuated life, an evergreen life. In other words, an everlasting life. life. Apparently, that young man, he would not die. That's why they used that tree to sort of represent that. So to celebrate his resurrection, remember when he went to hunt and the boar gored him and he died and he resurrected on the third day? They, they began to decorate eggs and they would also have gay celebrations uh, mostly in the springtime, you know, which later became known as Ashta. Ashta is where we come up with Easter. Aha. So the Greek for Sinaramis, the Greek word for Sinaramis is Easter. Now the egg, again, why the egg? It was just a symbol of continued life. You know, an egg sort of doesn't have a start and an end. It is all flow. It all flows. You won't know where it starts from and you won't know where it ends. So it was sort of a continued life. That was the symbol. And that's why they chose to decorate it, you know, as uh, after his resurrection. Are you shocked? Uh-huh. So we are shocked <laughs> as we realize that these celebrations that used to happen in this Babylonian system resemble very strongly with those holidays that we hold every year in Christianity, isn't it? Uh -huh. Now the shocking thing is that we have no biblical basis of our celebrations. Where in the Bible is it written that Jesus was born on the 5th of December? It's not written anywhere. And yet, historical records are very clear on the day Tammuz was born. He was born on the 25th of December. Together? We don't have evidence to prove these celebrations that we do have today. We find, of course, we find that Saturn established his counterfeit very early in history by doing this. Uh, he sort of wanted to counterfeit the coming of Jesus. 
so that when Jesus is born, so that when Jesus is born by a virgin birth, you would, it, you would, it would sort of create a doubt in you. Or, if it were true, then you would say, he won't be the first. Yeah. He won't be the first. We have Tammuz, who was also born by a virgin mother. In doing that, he sort of waters down the significance of the virgin birth. When Jesus died and he resurrected on the third day, we know that is key. That is very important to a Christian life. There's no Christianity without resurrection. But again, Lucifer manipulates this right early, in the very beginning almost, at the time, in the very early years, so that when it comes to pass, you would have definitely doubts in that. But these are plans of the devil in counterfeiting. So when he created that false religious system, now we realize that these Babylonian practices, you know, the, 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 the eggs and, and the Christmas, and they've sort of been inculcated. Eh? They've been, in, you know, inculcated into our religious systems today, into our church. And by the way, it is very deep. It's very deep. They've inculcated it deeply into our church that it has become a practice. And unfortunately, the church has carried and promoted these practices. Just go to the Catholic Church. See how the Reverend Mother Mary, the Queen of Heaven, isn't that the name they call her? Uh -huh. They call her actually the Queen of Heaven. We don't see the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. Mary is not the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. Where did they get that from? When Jesus addressed the church of the Pagamos in Revelation, he declares in his displeasure with some of you know, the practices of the church. And when he gets to Thyatira, he, you know, who was sort of fully incorporated into these practices, Jesus comes down heavily upon him. Yep. Implying, what does that mean? Jesus does not consent or approve these practices. So it was during the period of Constantine at the church, you know, when the church uh, became the state religion, you know, when they declared the church to be the key primary religion. But he sought to bring the you know, the pagan practices along with it. And so he created marriage of paganism and Christianity. He sort of got the Babylonian system, he got our Christian system, and they married them together. So certain practices were imported from the Babylonian system, and, 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 and they were married together with the Christian, or with the Christianity system that we have today. Which is why you find some of those practices that were imported directly from from the story we just read about Tammuz. Uh, Tammuz is more of the Jesus now, when they were integrating those, those systems together. Constantine, uh, Constantine took the practice of, of Saturnalia and incorporated it with a Christian calendar, calling it Christmas, and celebrating the birth of Christ. We do not have the birth of Christ. That came from the Babylonian system. Just to give you a bit of a, a hint, we normally celebrate Christmas in December 25th. Uh, during Christmas, it's usually winter in those areas of Middle East, especially in Israel and, and in some parts of the world. But the Bible says that during the time when Jesus was born, you know, we had, 
We had these shepherds that were outside in the night, rallying or taking care of their animals. How could shepherds be outside in the night, taking care of animals in winter? Doesn't make any sense? It doesn't. Absolutely doesn't. But so you know, this was what you know, this, this is what brought the Babylonian system into, you know, the Babylonian paganism system into our church today. When Jesus speaks to the church of Sadis, his complaint was they didn't pull completely away from the Babylonian practices. Uh, we do read that in Revelation chapter 32. No, so sorry, Revelation 3.2. 3, 2. Revelation 3.2. Uh, it says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Yes. What Jesus here is saying is, yes, you've pulled out of the system. Good. You've pulled out of the system deeply steeped in the Babylonian practices. But you didn't come all the way out. It's a good thing you've pulled out, but not entirely. That's literally what Jesus is telling them. So the Lord comes down heavy. And when we see chapter 17, he, 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 you know, of the revelations, the Babylonian system that has invaded the church, and he speaks of God is, you know, coming judgment against this system. You can read about that in, we won't go there, but it, I think it's, it, it's in 17. Now, it's quite fascinating to realize that, uh, you know, Satan evoked his own counterfeit of God's plan, which he knew. He sort of knew this plan from the beginning and he created a counterfeit so that by the time God's original plan is to come to pass, then that of Jesus would be the one to seem like it is the counterfeit. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting, isn't it? So it would seem that God had set his plans in the stars. You remember God said that I've set my stars for signs and seasons. So he had set his plans in the stars, which made it easy for Lucifer to read and interpret and create his plans. And that the gospel is really there in the signs of Zodak. Yep, it's actually there in the signs of Zodiac. You can find the gospel there if you read them very well. But astrology has become a perversion of that, evidently, as we see today. Uh, this came about the time of Nimrod, this ridiculous king, this mighty king who was one of the instigators of building the Tower of Babel to reach into heaven. I told you the motive of that was that should God again bring down the rain, he would survive it. He and his followers would survive the great flood should it ever come again. But that's because he was a rebellious kid. God had promised that he would never destroy the earth again with the flood. Probably didn't read that bit because of his rebelliousness. When the birth of Christ took place, there were still men in the East, isn't it? We, we know. Uh, you remember there was those, three, I think there were three wise men. The Bible says they read the stars and they were brought from afar. But they did what? They followed the stars. They read the stars and by doing that, they were able to know that a child had been born. Okay? And they followed the stars directly up to where Jesus was. Meaning the reading of the, there was a message in the stars. How would they know that a Messiah had been born? How? Because the message was clearly written in Zodiac, in those stars. It was there. That's how they were able to tell. That's how they were able to read 
and know that the Messiah had been born. So they came with gifts to do what? To worship Jesus. They knew. And so did Lucifer know. He also read the stars. He knew how the sun was going to be born. He knew how the Messiah was going to be born in the earth. So he sort of created his own counterfeit plan. And at the time when Jesus is going to be, then Jesus' plan would seem to be the one counterfeiting that of Lucifer. And so the Babylonian system was one of the most powerful religious systems till today. I mean, it is incorporated into our church systems so much so that we are tied closely to it. You go to some churches, man, you'll find 90%. It is the Babylonian system still ruling in there. But we have many interesting books uh, on the Zodiac and the message of the gospel in the Zodiac. You can do a bit of research on that and you'll be blessed. If you're interested in a more detailed study of these religions that we find on the 10th chapter of Genesis, there is a book called the Genesis Record. He's sort of documented and listed all these things. He's done pretty good research and study. It was written by Dr. Henry Morrison. You know, it sort of traces down each one of Noah's son's national roots to the very detail. Uh, you, you can find it in one of your closest bookstores. All right. Verse 13. And Mizraim. In the original Hebrew, this particular son's name is Misraim. Some English, you know, translations still use the word Mizraim. But the Hebrew Old Testament, however, always refers to the nation of Egypt. Uh, you know, using this word, Misraim. Both in Genesis and the story of the Exodus, they sort of use that. For this reason, many translations simply use the word Egypt to avoid, you know, the confusion between Misraim and Misraim. So they would rather just, you know, throw their Egypt in and, and, and avoid that confusion. So, and Mizraim begat Ludim, and Anim, and, La, and Lahabim, and Aftalim, and Pathuzim, and, Ko, and Kaslehim, out of whom came Philistim, and Kafotrim, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Jigasite, and the Havite, and the Akite, and the Sanite, you know, thought to be the Oriental nation, and the, and the Avidite, and the Zamarite, and the Hamathite, and the afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, and to Gaza as goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zoboim, even unto Lasher. So these are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. So these families of Ham were dispersed during the time of the Tower of Babel. That's where they sort of dispersed when the Gentiles were divided. Then, you know, his brother Shame sort of lost track of them and, and sort of he stopped, you know, closely tracking or writing details about them. Sidon was the home of the Phoenicians and, uh, you know, and he has continued to this day, which is the area of Southern Lebanon. Uh-huh. Sidon was the son of Canaan and uh, who was the son of Ham, of course. And uh, Canaan was the son who was cast. We saw that in episode 8. Now, of course, the Phoenicians were not black. I explained that more closely, I think, in episode 8, with this ridiculous theory that had been come or produced that uh, with this great lie 
that the blacks were cursed as a result of the curse that was pronounced upon Canaan by his grandfather. So the Phoenicians were not black. Uh, so this clean share that, you know, this tell that promoted by the slave traders and the, you know, that the Canaan, that Canaan was black and the black people were made servants by Noah's curse on him. Nah. Nah, 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 nah. That creature was wrong. It was a total lie and misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and not just knowing what the word of God says. The curse went to Canaan and, 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 and not misery. Misery became Egypt. Canaan was one of the greatest nations back in the day. But again, Canaan, you know, those are the Arabs. They didn't, they're not black. So we will follow, we will now follow Shem's descendants and eventually get out Abraham. We're going to be move away from the other kids and just, you know, sort of focus on more, on more of Shem. As I said, the descendants of Ham sort of got dispersed at the Tower of Babel when God came down and, you know, confused them with multiple languages. So now the focus is mostly going to be on Shem. Shem sort of lost his contact with his brothers and he couldn't track them any further. So let's go to 21. And to shame also the father. Interesting. You know, we haven't seen this thing mostly, the father. Uh, the term father is often used to refer, you know, to any male ancestor. Uh, we can find a bit of that in Genesis 15, 15 and Genesis 31, 3. This makes shame the father of the Eberites. In the sense that as Eber's great-grandfather, Shem is the ancestor, uh, is the ancestor of that people. You know, it's through Shem that we have the Eber. Eber, it's through Eber that we come with the Hebrews. So through the Eberites, um, eventually Shem's line will lead to Abraham or, or Abraham, you know, prior to the promise. He was called Abram. All of the children of Eber. Eber was the original name of uh, the Hebrews, you know. The sort of Hebrews sprang from Heber. Yeah. And that is through Abraham and his descendants. So the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. Uh, the children of Shem, we have Elam and Ashu, uh -huh. Afak, Sad, and Lud and Aram and the children of Aram, we have Uz, we have Aul and Gether and Mash. In their Afaxad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, an interesting name there. Peleg, which means division. It means division. For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, there are those that believe that there was a second catalysmic sort of change that took place upon the earth. Uh, it's believed that at the time of Peleg, we had, you know, continental divisions that happened as a result of the flood. That these continents we have the, the you know the the, the continent uh, the, the Africa the America and and and, and 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 Europe and all that stuff they sort of they are division so that they are divided but these you know mega water bodies in between them happen at the time of Peleg but that's one theory the second theory is that uh, it's referring to the Tower of Babel that not only were the languages mixed, but also the earth was divided. So this, so we have two theories. One, you know, the catastrophic one where the planets were divided, not planets. The yeah, the continents. And then the second being at the time of Babel when human beings or languages were created. Uh, the stories of the flood are common in every nation around the world, sure. Differently is told, but in principle, it comes down to the same thing. A great train that fell upon the world. And, 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 and very common origin, you know, of the nation. So basic story of the tremendous flood uh, that destroyed the earth, you know, and a single man 
and his family escaped by a building of, you know, a, a boat. Some, they will say big boat. Some will say small boat. Is is sort of a general, is the general essence of the story of the flood that you can, that you can find in almost every ethnic group. You can go back uh, far enough in history. Uh -huh. So you'll find the story. In, in, in principle, they're sort of speaking about a rain and a boat and a family. Now, the story could be told differently, but in principle, those are the key words they usually find in almost every ethnic group mentioned in Egypt. And Joktan, that is 26, verse 26. And Joktan begat Almodad and Shilifa, and Hazmarveth and Jera and Hajram and Uzol and Dikla and Obal and Amihail and Sheba and Othero and Havila and, and Jobab. Jobab. The Jobab we find here, or that is mentioned here, is, is thought you know, by some scholars to be the Job we read about. You know. And you know, so Job, the book of Job is, is considered to be one of the oldest books in the Bible. So this Job up here is that Job. We will start about Job later on. So all these were the sons of Joktan. 31. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So the verses, uh, the, the verse here mostly serves to formally conclude the genealogy of Shem. Sort of, sort of, you know, closing up the genealogy of Shem and his descendants along with, you know, describing the religions in which they settled, uh, the, reg sorry, the regions in which they settled at a later stage. However, the line of Shem to Abraham will be described specifically in the next chapter. Uh, so don't miss out episode 11. We'll find more details there. You know, it'll sort of specialize mostly because you know Abraham is the next in line. Like, as, I, as I've been sharing this before, God has no real interest in giving us more details about the different genealogies of people. He simply gives us a little bit of detail and then he lets that line go. And then he comes back to the line that really matters. The, the genealogies that have no interest in the bringing of the Messiah, God has no uh, interest in giving us those details. So you'll find the Bible mostly focusing on only the line that brings about the Messiah. Right from Genesis uh, chapter 1 verse 1, you'll find there is that line. Uh, when we come to Abel and Cain, and, and Cain, you know, and, and then from Cain, then we'll come to uh, other sons of Abraham. Uh, when we came to Seth, because of Seth, we come to Laban, uh, to, to Lamech, and then from Lamech, we come to Noah, because, but because of the line. God is only interested mostly in the line. So as we know, uh, that uh, it is through shame that comes the Messiah. That's why there is a bit of a drop when it comes to the other children, that is Japheth and Ham. So, this entire chapter has been sort of devoted to explaining the origins of the Middle East, uh, the you know Middle East various nations, mostly this chapter eleven. All people, including every possible tribe or race, uh, are descendant of those that descended from Noah and his son. Uh, his son is three boys: that is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're together. Yeah, so notably, uh, the details in this part of the Bible, you know, are only concerned with the family relationships, really. Nothing more than that. Other than a quick comment about Peleg, we just read here in uh, Genesis 10.25. They serve how you know, different tribes wanted to 
what up with the separated languages and terrorists, uh, you know, the different territories that sprang out of that. Uh, I would say that it's left entirely for the next scripture as we, we study more details about the Tower of Babel. That explanation will come through to this, you know, from the straw of the Tower of Babel. Uh, so we'll start from here, you know, episode 6, episode 11. That's next week. Do we have anybody who has not received Jesus Christ here? I'm sure you could be up there watching us and you haven't received Jesus Christ as your personal savior. If you're there and you haven't received Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. You know, you're not gonna make it. This I can assure you if you do not receive Jesus Christ. We've been seeing right from Genesis chapter one how God came up with a redemptive plan to redeem man. When you look at the story of Noah, you know, the ark, the ark is an analogy of Jesus Christ. Ark was the only safe place through which Noah would receive his salvation. If Noah and his family had not entered into the ark, definitely they would be wiped out of the planet. We know very well that there's going to be a second judgment. There's going to be another judgment. Uh, the Bible speaks about the tribulation. So please, if you haven't received Jesus Christ, it's high time you do that. If you do not, the Bible is very clear. The Bible says there's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and life. He's the only way to the Father. There are no other ways. There's only one door to the ark, and that is through the door that God himself put there and that is through his son jesus christ so please pray this prayer with me i want you to say heavenly father i realize that i'm a sinner but right now i repent of my sins i make you my lord i receive the free gift of forgiveness of sin I need you, Jesus. Be my savior. Great, so right now I declare my faith and I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and praise God. If you just prayed that prayer with me online, please let us know. Uh, you, can let us through, you can let us know through our website by simply scanning the QR code on your screen. Or you can, you know, leave us a comment down there uh, if you're watching this episode. And we'll send you a free ebook, which is your gift today. It'll guide you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, welcome to the family of God. Amen. Thank you for yours, uh, for those that have attended today. We'll start from here again tomorrow. God bless you. God take care of you. And I love you. See you next week. Bye for now.